Hi, everybody. This is Sarah Mastros from witchlessons.com. The little video you're about to watch is excerpted from the full class, Planetary Pentacles of Solomon, Magician King. The full class uh, is basically just more of the same. So if you like this video, you'll like the class. Uh, I look forward uh, to seeing you in class, but please enjoy this excerpt whether you want to take the class or not. Bye, everybody. The six pentacles of the moon that are in Solomon's book or in, sorry, Mather's edition. Um, we're gonna talk about all of them, but just from looking at them, it should be clear to you what I was saying before that the first one is not the same shape. Like all the other pentacles are circular. Okay, so this first one, you will often see it sideways. A lot of people put this part over here, which is obviously ridiculous. It has writing on it. So it has like a very clear orientation. It's clearly supposed to be this way. People turn it over because there's this like, because historically it is described as a gate. And I guess people think it looks more like a gate on its side where this is the doorway, but it's not. This is like, this is two different things. First of all, this is like a latch. This middle part is like a latch that pulls out and the gate swings open. But more importantly, see this, this is a four pin tumbler lock. This style of tumbler, tumbler lock, this exact one here is from ancient Egypt. But this style of tumbler lock was the like de facto kind of lock and key used throughout the Middle East and Europe, basically starting from like the oldest locks we dig up through like the 1600s. This is basically how all locks work. And hopefully it's clear to you that this seal is a picture of this object. Now, the reason I know this is because fun fact, my late father used to collect antique padlocks. So like if you Google Mastro's collection padlocks, you will see why I know a lot about padlocks. None of that learning was, was voluntary. I was just taught a lot about padlocks as a kid. Okay, so the text on this one, right? This one has a lot of text on it. Um, so, oops, sorry. Line one here and line four are the versicle. Now, when I make this pentacle, I actually usually switch lines four and five. Like I want the versicle to be at the top and the bottom, but I will talk about a little bit why I think it's not that way, but I switch it when I make this one. So like I posted a picture of me having made an example of this pentacle in the Facebook group. And if you examine it, you'll see that I switched these two lines. Okay, this line here is some God names. This line right here is the most holy name of God. We're gonna talk about that. Can you guys see where my cursor is? I think no. Yeah, no, we can. Oh, you can? Okay, excellent, right? So this line here underneath the most holy name, again, that's the end of the versicle. And then this last line here is four different angel names. So I wrote them all out here because they're a little bit hard to see in the handwriting. Um, the versicle, like that's a quote from Torah. So I know exactly what it says, so I can put vowels in it. These other ones, I have not been putting vowels in them to sort of stress that like all I have is what's on the pentacle. Right. So this particular versicle, I think I explained this in a previous lesson, but if I didn't, a versicle is just like a portion of a Torah verse. Um, so this one, and you'll see as we go through, many of them come from Tehillim, which is the actual book of the name Christians call Psalms, uh, 107, 16, right? And it says, he broke open the gates of brass and cut the bars of iron asunder. So that translation there is the JPS translation, the Jewish Publication Society. That's a pretty standard translation. I'm usually going to use that. But I want to make some comments here. First of all, this word brass here, it actually means bronze. Like brass was not invented yet. It means bronze, right? And broken usually means broken, but it can also mean to separate or to like open up a nut. So in the context of a door, like I don't think this is like battering down the gates. I think this is just regular like opening the gates. Like you're not damaging them when you break them open, you're just opening them. Um, if you read the context of this particular Psalm, which is the first in book five of the Psalms, the doors that are being opened in the Psalm are very clearly like bondage and slavery. Like that is the door that is being opened is the door to freedom. That's like, that's what this quote is about in the Psalm. Okay, so the center lock here, right? in the pentacle is the most holy name. This name cannot be pronounced by the human voice. Some people say Jehovah or Yahweh. Personally, I believe both of those pronunciations to be like 
weird and gross and appropriative, you are not supposed to say this name out loud. It, it actually like, I actually really does bother me when people use those, but I don't know, people do a lot of terrible shit to Jewish gods. And so I, I don't know, I get over it. Like as long as you're not a Nazi, fine, but it'd be better if we didn't try and say that name. So respectful people uh, use a placeholder instead. So there's a lot of different, it's called like a, I actually had a conversation on Facebook. It's technically called a no one name, um, but I think of it as an apotropaic cryptonym. Like you are changing and saying something else. So you don't have to say this very powerful name, right? Just like we sometimes call, God, I don't even want to say the word out loud. Like the F word, we sometimes call them like the good neighbors or the kindly ones or like the fair folk. Cause we don't want to say a name that's going to attract attention. Or similarly, the way we might call like Hades, we might call him Pluton, right? The rich one because we don't really want to say his name, it might attract his attention, right? Similarly, we use a lot of different ones. The one I usually use is Hashem, which is Hebrew, it just means the name. A lot of people say tetragrammaton, which is Greek, and it means four letter word, which I personally find delightful as that also means like a naughty word. Um, so I like to think of it as the four letter word, ooh. Okay, um, the oldest surviving inscription we have of this name is not that old, right? It's like ninth century BCE. But pretty much everybody is in agreement that the name itself is much older than that. And probably there used to be, in addition to like a prohibition on speaking it, there probably used to be a prohibition on writing it. And that's why we don't find it written down until much earlier. It's pretty much everybody's in agreement. This is a very old name. It's probably Canaanite in origin. Um, but like in terms of language, like those Semitic languages are very tightly entwined. So it's, they're still easy to understand, right? This is almost certainly related to the Hebrew word, root word meaning to be. And you're gonna see that about a lot of the names we're gonna talk about. Um, it's also related to the name Eye, Asher Eye, which we're gonna talk about later in this lesson, right? So that's the name that like when Moses asks the burning bush, like what its name is. And he's like, I am what I am, right? So we'll talk a little bit about that name. So up here in the second line, we have a list of different God names, right? Now in Judaism, there's this real tension that we don't always like to talk about, about the fact that like there's one God, but also he's got a lot of, like they've got a lot of different names and those names are not interchangeable. Like when you say a different name, you get a different thing. So is it one thing or a lot of things? We don't talk about it, it's complicated. But like really, like it really is. It's like, a, it's a mystery because I feel like the best answer you're gonna get to that. It's sort of what I was saying before about the like El participating in Elohim. So the first name we have here is Yahoo. It, it, um, it, it basically just means Lord. It's usually translated Lord. I guess what I will say is when it's in Theophoric. So like people that are named after gods. So like the name Eliyahu, which in English is the name Elijah. Like it has this Yahoo name in it, right? Um, the next name is just the same holy name we had in the middle, right? Same one. The next name is L, which we talked about a lot last lesson, right? And the third one is Ja, right? This is a very old name, possibly the oldest of all of the names we're gonna talk about anywhere in this course, Ja, right? Um, it's just another name for God. Like it doesn't, it doesn't have a like, its meaning is fully syntactic and not really, it doesn't really have a semantic meaning, I guess is what I'm saying. We don't really know, or at least like its semantic meaning is lost, right? So like the word hallelujah means hail ja, right? Or ya, yeah. I, I always say it ja, but it's more accurately ya, yeah, right? Um, this word is associated with wisdom and understanding. Um, okay, so what I want you to notice is three of these four names are actually basically just grammatical variations on the same name. Like Yahoo, Hashem, and Ja are like all the same name with like, we sort of permuted the letters on. And then L is a totally different word, like linguistically unrelated. We talked about that one a lot, right? So that's one of the things I want you to keep in mind here. But these are all very like sort of straightforward names that they don't, remember I was saying the different names have their own like different flavors. We talked about that when we talked about making the great seal. These are all pretty like, relatively neutral ones, right? As opposed to like El Emet, the God of truth, or like El Chai, the God of life. Those have like really sort of specific, right? Those are God's of thing. This is like big G, you wave your hands around God is how my grandmama would have said it. 
Okay, so line four, sorry, I don't have a little picture here. So this is the line on the very bottom of the pentacle. Um, has four names, which we generally interpret to be angel names, right? These names, as far as I know, none of these names appear anywhere else, right? Like these names are on this pentacle. They don't occur in like other magical texts. I mean, that predate this one. They don't occur in uh, Torah at all, right? So we're gonna talk about each of these names in, one at a time. And you'll be able to see that some of them, I feel like I can give you a very clean translation of what they mean. And some of them I'm gonna have to like, play some magician rabbi games, right? But they're all gonna be, I don't know, I'm gonna do my best, but feel free to push back if you disagree. Like I welcome a debate on these, I guess is what I'm saying, but I'm doing the best I can. Okay, the first one, Shewell, is how I would say, it. again, there's no vowels on the pentacles, so it's hard to know exactly, right? I think this word is almost certainly, like even if you don't know any Hebrew at all, if you look at this word, and this word, which is Aramaic, and this word, which is Hebrew, those are all versions of the same thing, right? Which is a name, a Semitic name for the underworld, and also a name for a variety of underworld deities, right? So just like Hades is a name and a place, just like hell is a goddess and a place, like Sheol is also a personage and a place. And this name is clearly a variation on this one. It's, a, it's if you took this word and like tried to spell it like it was an angel, but keep the sound the same, like with this L at the end, right? So angel names routinely have this L name at the back of them. We talked about that. Um, I think we talked about that time in the last lesson, right? We'll talk about it a lot as we go forward. So I am very confident translating this word as Sheol, right? So this word, Sheol, um, if we look into its roots, right, it, it comes from a root meaning like to be crushed or ruined or exiled, which like, yeah, like you're dead. So you're, you're, you're pretty exiled and you're like crushed in a very literal, like pushed down into the underworld. Sounds. L again, I was saying is like the standard ending for a name. So if you wanted to turn the name Sheol, which is already understood to be like an underworld deity into an angel name. Like you wanted to sort of corral this not this pre-Jewish and extra Jewish Semitic spirit, right? Into like a Jewish framework, you would just change the way it was spelled to be exactly this. So I'm quite confident. Like this one I think is very clear. It is very obvious to me why, like as an initial magical pentacle that is for opening doors, like you would want to involve the underworld in that because like the under. I, I mean, I don't know if it's not clear, it, it'll become clear as we talk more about this pentacle, but it's obvious to me. Maybe it's not obvious to you yet, but it will be. Okay, the next one, Vavel, Vavul, Wawul, like again, it's hard to say how to do it. This is like a weird spelling. This, Vav, like, it, uh, it's weird. I actually think this is probably Vav L, like the L of Vav. Right, that would not change the sound of this word at all, changing it to this spelling. Like this word could definitely be pronounced the same as this one. And now I've got this familiar L meaning. Vav uh, is the like, you know, if I wanted to spell out the word, the letter C, I would spell it like C E E, right, or S E E to to explain what the sound of it is. That's the name of the letter, right? This is the name of this letter right? It means hook or latch. You can see, I mean, it looks like a hook or a latch. Like that's what that word means. Um, okay. If you wanted to like play a game, a rabbinic game with this spelling, vuv slash aleph vuv in modern Hebrew means and slash or. But uh, I think it is ridiculous to try and make this word mean that. But if you wanted to, you could play a cool, I'm always saying about like pun magic. There's an opportunity for some pun poetry magic there if you want to play with it. Um, so I interpret this name as the latch of L, which since this pentacle is designed to open doors and clearly features a lock, uh, I feel confident in that translation. Like it's clearly on point that I, those letters mean that I don't have trouble with this one. This one is, in my opinion, the hardest of these to translate, right? So, Iashel. Iash, right? 
means to like cause despair, right? But if you, in proto-Sinetic, if you look at the individual like hieroglyph letters, you have an arm and then this is an ox, it means strong. And this is the ground. It's, it's like not obvious that's what that character is, but it is, right? I am told by like historians of language, you know, this is pretty speculative. I, whenever I resort to proto synatic like that's a sign that I'm having difficulty translating one, right? But if like arm strong ground means to push down and the root of a word that means despair, having a root that just means literally physically push down makes perfect sense to me. And in this context, I actually think it does mean physically push down for reasons that will become clear later. Like I think this is the L of pushing down who, who is going to be the L of making people despair. But in this context, we are invoking them to more physically push things down, like push things down into the underworld and also push down the tumblers in this lock that we're constructing. Okay, uh, Vehiel is a little hard, right? But this word here, Vehiu, means they will have been, right? So this, I mean, okay, I realize that maybe if you don't speak Hebrew, it's not super clear that these two words like are closely related, but that he, Hebrew conjugates weirdly, right? And this is actually a form of this root word to be that we've been talking about, hey, yeah, right? Um, so even if this isn't they will have been, it's definitely some kind of like past tense of the to be. This is a little tricky, you know, verb tenses in Hebrew are not the same as they are in English. So particularly, you know, to be is a really irregular translation in English, like am, was, had, has, have been. Like the word, it's a weird word, right? It's weird in Hebrew too, and the weirdness doesn't fully match up, right? But this angel name is definitely related to this name. Well, definitely is a strong word. I think those names are related. Okay, so, but if we put these names together, we have underworld, latch, push down, will have been. That is to say this pentacle, which is designed to open magical doorways, literally has the words, unlock the gates of the underworld written on it. So I am quite comfortable with this translation, right? So just to show you, these are the gates into the temple. This is the gate into like, you know, the, the temple in ancient Israel had like catacombs underneath of it. This is the entrance to those catacombs. If anybody wants to try like some like trance journey through these gates here with this pentacle, strongly recommended, right? So what they're saying is, oops, like with these words, you're gonna push down, right? on this lock to open it, right? So I'm gonna talk about how to use it and I will explain magically, like technically a little more, but first I wanna talk broadly, right? So this pentacle, the first way I use it is to open the gates of the underworld, right? So like oracular necromancy, talking to dead people, like you did in lesson one, if you're having trouble with it, throw this pentacle at it, right? I sometimes use this one to empower other pentacles. Like I will open a gate to like a magical space and then do things with other pentacles, right? And I also use this pentacle as a sort of like key card to access a like secret magical teaching place, uh, which is like the blah, 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 contact us on in secret magic organization headquarters. You'll learn more about it in lesson 12 if you make it that far. Lesson 12 will be like an only oral teaching. Like I will not be recording that one. And like, I'm not gonna, I mean, I'm not gonna like sue you for copyright infringement or like curse you if you record my oral teachings, but like, I'd rather you didn't. And it would be a shitty thing to do. Like, please don't do it. Okay, so uh, the most common way many people use this is to open metaphoric doors, right? The kind of magic that we usually talk about is road opening. Like you could do that with this pentacle. This pentacle, particularly given the context of the Psalm is specifically good for getting people out of prison, either literal or metaphoric prison. Okay, we're gonna talk about how to teach a pentacle to your book. But in order to do that, I'm actually gonna talk about other pentacles first, how to do them. And then we're gonna have to modify that a little bit for this one, just because it's a different shape. So the geometry of it works a little differently. The first most important step is to understand the seal. Like 
I am not saying you can't make these seals work without understanding them. I see many magicians get solid results from these pentacles, despite the fact they obviously do not understand them. Like you ask them like, what does this word mean? They're like, I don't know, it doesn't matter. And like, I think it does matter, but you don't really, like it's not the only thing that matters, but you should do that first. Next thing you should do is just physically draw the seal in your book. If you are clever handed, like good at drawing, you might want to draw it once you're already in magic trance, but I am like not, <laughs> my ability to draw straight lines is like not that great, especially when I'm also trying to do magic. So I draw them first and then do the magic on top of them. But if you're an artist, you might want to do those at the same time. Next thing you're going to do is open your great seal. And that involves like, first you get in magic space time and then you invoke Solomon and then you open the seal. There's the whole process, right? So this is where the actual magic starts. Like before that you're doing just like book learning and then just draw on a thing. Okay, you're gonna awaken the pentacle. This is broadly the same way you would awaken any kind of talisman or any kind of physical object or even materia, right? But pentacles, like we're gonna do them a little specifically because they have this geometry to them that we can access. The first thing you wanna do uh, again, the first moon one, the one we just talked about, is actually a special case. This slides maybe should have been a different order, sorry. Right? Um, you're going to awaken the circle as a boundary first. And your goal is it's basically like a semi permeable filter. Some things can cross in and out of that circle, and some things can't. Or I usually think of it as a lens. Like I'm going to build up basically a cone of power inside the pentacle. And I'm going to focus it through the lens of the versicle around the, and you know, the things around the boundary are actually not always versicles. I'm going to focus it through the lens of whatever's around the boundary. Next, <coughs> excuse me. All right. The next thing you're going to do is awaken the internal geometry, right? We talked a little bit about that with the great seal, which had actually a much more complicated geometry than any of these do because these were drawn by Samuel Little Mathers and the Great Seal was drawn by me and I have a master's degree in fancy geometry. So like I, I lean into the geometry part on these pretty hard. Then the last thing you're gonna do is awaken the names on the inside, like call those spirits until you like feel their presence, right? You're gonna do that over and over until you just, just like with the Great Seal or any other kind of magic, if you're, if you're, if you have any experience at magic, like you don't have to be good at it. If you just have experience. So if you don't have this now, by the end of this class, you will develop this experience. You just can kind of feel when it clicks into place. Like it'll come together and you'll be able to feel it. Like it won't, there'll be this sensation of the energy just kind of like grinding around and eventually it'll like find its own rhythm and like it'll be smooth and clean and it won't be like all turbulent, right? When it gets to that point, just shut up and sit there and listen, like, or scry, like if you're visual, like, Try and receive information from the pentacle, like try and have a conversation with it. And especially if you're new to this, that can take a while. Like, I don't mean sit there and listen for two minutes. I mean, like until your candle burns down, like, like an appreciable length of time, sit there and listen, right? And you can subtly pour energy in, but at this point you should be, it should be the other way. You should be receiving from the pentacle, not pushing it down, right? You may or may not get some special instructions at this point. So I, a lot of times get instructions to like color it, right? They'll be like, I wish those letters you drew had been yellow. And it's like, okay, I can make them yellow. Like, fine, right? So I get that a lot of times. Sometimes I get other like, uh, you, you, you should draw a heart in the upper left corner. I'm like, why? And they're like, you just should. I'm like, okay, right? Unless they tell me to do something that like, seems dangerous or really like insane. I'm mostly just like, okay, if you want your name to be yellow, your name can be yellow. Like I just trust my instincts on it. Uh, next thing, whenever you're done, right? You're gonna like sort of just close the energy in, but you don't really have to do that. Just flip to the page with the great seal on it. Like, like the pedal was closed because you changed pages in the book, right? And then spin down the great seal. And that basically the way I think of it is it sort of like puts the whole book to sleep. Right, so at that point you're done. Remember to say thank you to everybody. I like to wrap my book up before I put it away, but that's like possibly because I like spill stuff on my desk pretty often. Like I'm not, as I mentioned, I'm quite clumsy. Like it's not just fine motor control. My gross motor control is also not tip top. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about awakening the first moon pentacle in particular. 
This one, it's shaped like a lock, right? So that's how we're, that's like the geometry of this one is it's a, it's like a mechanism, right? So I'm going to teach it as a lock and key, right? The versicle told us that that middle name, the sacred name in the middle is the key. Like it's the key and also the keyhole, right? The tumblers are made out of God and angel, right? So first you're going to awaken the central key, then the gate, then the lock tumblers, then you're going to lock it with the holy name and then you're going to let it sit. I know that didn't make sense. So now I'm going to like do it here. So you guys can see my cursor. Nobody said no, so I'm gonna assume that means yes. Yeah, we can see your cursor. Okay, excellent, right? So I'm gonna try and walk you through this. So the first thing you want, this should all be drawn before you start awakening it. Unless your Hebrew is very good, the versicles, I would just do in English. Like I write them in Hebrew, but I say them in English. So we broke open the gates of bronze and sundered the iron bars. You'll notice I also changed the translation a little bit because I didn't like their translation, right? For the reasons that I explained, right? So the first thing I'm gonna do, but again, I'm, you know, I'm showing you this, when I make this pentacle, I put this line down here. I, I, I understand, I'll explain why it's not that way in a second, but I like it better to put the, the versicle around the outside, which is partly about the way I'm using the versicle to like build this boundary around it. So that's why I switched them. But in this picture, they're not switched, right? Cause I wanna teach you like, I don't necessarily want to teach you my idiosyncrasies, but I'll explain them, right? So that's the first thing you're going to do is you're basically going to cast, I say a circle, but in this particular instance, you actually have to cast this more complicated shape, which when I imagine it, I simultaneously imagine as that four tumbler lock, but I also imagine it as a gate with like posts. And this piece here, it's going to swing this direction when I open it, right? So this is a keyhole, but it's also... Like this is like zoomed in on the lock and the keyhole, but it's also, I zoom out and I'm also looking at the gate. Like it's fractal, right? They're the same shape. If I kept zooming in, I assume every atom of that gate I'm imagining is actually shaped like this because that's how nature works, right? That's how natural shapes work. So the next thing you wanna do is build, like, so you wanna include these bars. You wanna like make the whole structure of the gate at this point, right? Like really make sure you like understand physically, like, I think this is where normal people would say visualize, but I'm not very visual. So I'm just going to say like, you need to imagine that this really is a lock and it really is a gate, right? Is both of those things. Next, you're going to build and set the tumblers. So these tumblers are part of the, the God names. These are part of the lock, right? So I'm going to call those Yahoo, Hashem, El, Ja. And I'm going to do that just like we did the great seal. I'm going to do it over and over until I like feel them click. This one's the hardest to get to click because you can't say it out loud, but you already called it here, right? So I really encourage you here to like not try and say this name. You can repeat the names of the letters, but really like you are calling to the ineffable one who moment by moment breathes the universe into being. And like, if you would rather call that a different name, like that's okay. Uh, linguistically, this name is also closely, I'm going to take back what I was about to say. I'm going to keep that part out. So it's, it's related to the verb to be. Almost every linguist is in agreement with it, right? So you're going to set the tumblers inside the lock, right? And now I'm going to basically build the key tumblers, like the, the teeth of the key. I'm going to build those out of the angel names. That's why I think they're down here because this actually is one mechanism and this is another mechanism. This is the lock and this is the key, but I don't like having to push my key through the boundary I just made. So I build the key inside the lock. Like when I build it, the key's already in the lock, but I haven't unlocked it yet, right? So that's the way I do it. So I'm gonna call these, right? Sheowell, Vavel, Iashel, Viahel, right? Now I've built a lock and a key. I'm going to use my key to move the tumblers and lock. If you want, I should have put a link to this. Uh, remind me after class and I will find you guys a YouTube video that like shows how those four pin tumblers work. If you're having trouble imagining how that lock and key works. Like 
I'm sure YouTube will show you like the insides of a tumbler. By the way, most modern locks still operate basically the same as that lock. They're just more sophisticated versions. That's just how locks work. When, okay, so when you make this in your book, leave the key, like after you unlock the gate, don't take the key back out in your imagination. I think, I think that, and that's why I switch these. I never take the key out of the lock. I just turn it locked or unlocked in the book. And partly that's because I have mine in a book, so I can already lock the whole book, right? So there are occasions when I guess I would do them separately. I can even imagine a circumstance where I would make this on a separate piece, like physically make this and this separate pieces of metal or paper, whatever I was making it on, right? Any questions about that? Awesome. All right. Um, most of our pentacles, they just spin open and closed, like once they're made, when you want to use them, most of them spin open and closed the same way the great one does. But this one opens and closes like a gate, right? So the first thing, the way I think of it is like I tickle awake that Hashem key in the middle. And then when I'm turning it, I am turning it. This part isn't too important. So like if this doesn't make sense, that's okay. You can ignore it. But in my mind, and like I'm, I'm pretty good at this higher dimensional geometry for a human. Like I'm pretty good at it. Like the key is not turning, you know, you have two dimensions on your pentacle. Your pentacle's on a piece of paper. It's effectively two dimensional, right? Your three dimensions, there's one dimension perpendicular to the paper that like you exist in. The dimension you are turning the key through is not that. It is a fourth dimension perpendicular to all three of those. But again, like if that is confusing, you actually don't have to worry about it. It's built into the, like that's the, how the mechanism of this pentacle works. But like you don't actually have to understand the inside of how a lock works to operate a lock. Like you could just turn the key, it'll work. But if you want to figure, if you want to dig in and figure out how it works, which I want to do because I want to be able to make my own that aren't, that Solomon didn't teach me. Like I want to learn how he made this, right? That's, I, I'm pretty confident that's what's going on. So then again, for me, the gates always open back into the page. Like there's an underworld gate. So for me, they're always going to open down. Like the gates don't come this way. They go that way. They open into the underworld. Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about how to use pentacles. Um, any of the pentacles, right? And there are a lot of different options. But the first thing you're going to do is like sigilize. This is one, this is the simplest way, in my opinion, to do, I mean, the simplest way to work with a pentacle is just like use it as a talisman. Like you just have it on you and it does some kind of unspecified shit vaguely related to its purpose. But you can also use them more specifically, right? To, and the way I do that is sigilize the intent. You can do that into like however you want, right? Take that sigil, carve it into the bottom of a candle. I, for whatever reason, I can't really justify the fact that I really think beeswax for this. Like, I really feel like it's way better and easier. Like beeswax feels like a very useful material to like lubricate this, but I've done it with not beeswax candles and it works just fine. It's just better, right? Open up the great seal. Put the candle on the pentacle you want to use. Open that pentacle, spin it open, call the spirits of the seal and just like tell them what you want, right? And then whatever that, you know, the sigil you made on the bottom, you need to make a visual sigil of it, but you also need to make an auditory sigil. You need to turn it into a name somehow. The same way you would turn it into a picture, right? There are a lot of methods for like turning a sentence into a sound. Do some of those, right? And just call it over and over until you're done. Like again, and done means like you can kind of feel it working, right? Next thing you want to do again is just listen. Like wait until the candle is fully burned down, which is why I'm saying use itty bitty little tea lights. You can even use like birthday candles. Sometimes when I want them to go fast, I use birthday candles. Um, but you got to be careful not to set your book on fire when you use birthday candles because they're really highly colored. And so the wax is like hotter than a normal candle. Um, and they burn down really fast. So don't set your book on fire. Um, like tea lights, hard to knock over a tea light, right? Um, let the candle burn the whole way down, say thank you, say goodbye, close the pentacle, close the seal, close the book. That's like the most straightforward way to use these pentacles. Um, I see a lot of people doing them that way, more or less. Like that's a pretty straightforward way people do them. Okay, before we go on to the second one, I'm gonna take a little break. Um, 
I will be back. And does anybody have questions about that first pentacle? Or really about anything else that we've done up to here? Okay, I'm gonna run to the bathroom real quick. I'll be back in like two minutes. Feel free to take a break.